When we looked at artificial intelligence, we said, hey, artificial intelligence helps businesses reduce their cost. Artificial intelligence helps businesses improve the customer experience. And artificial intelligence overall just allows businesses uh, to make more money. And we saw that particularly on the insurance side of things. The, our first investor, our first VC ever was because I saw him tweeting, our first VC ever in Lula. Uh, I reached out to him because I saw him tweeting on LinkedIn that they were making investments in the midst of a pandemic. So you want to go ahead and make yourself a big target for luck, and a big target for opportunity. And, and one of the ways you do that is with curiosity. <laughs> So everyone's saying these days AI is going to take your job. Well, today's guest has a company that may actually do it, uh, but it's not all dark and gloomy. He's going to tell us some tips for jobs you should target. Uh, but we'd like to welcome Michael Vega Sands uh, to the show. Welcome, Michael. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate so, it. So for, uh, for anyone that doesn't know you, why don't you just kind of give your title? Uh, so. As you mentioned, my name is Michael Vegas Sands. I am a co-founder and the president of a company called Lula. Yeah. Okay. So we're we're going to talk a lot about Lula. Uh, it's um, he's really taking the the boring industry of insurance and doing some really cool things in it. Uh, but why don't we talk a little bit about your background? Because when we first met, uh, you told me some really interesting things in it. So let's just go through that a little bit. Yeah. So I was born and raised in Miami. And a lot of people think Miami, but they think the exotic lifestyle, they think the beaches. I grew up on a small farm with horses, wow. chickens, and goats, <laughs> and that was about 20 miles inland. And so I had a really, really unconventional childhood, but it was an amazing childhood. For college, I got the opportunity to go to a really small school called Babson College. Mm -hmm. And it was at Babson where I fell in love with technology. <clears throat> and what really drew me to technology was the fact that you can, have, you can encounter a problem. You can have an idea for how you want to solve that problem. And you have this abstract idea, and you can turn it into something concrete uh, over the course of a couple of hours or a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And if that idea that you had, that you turned into a concrete solution, can solve a problem for yourself, well, then it can probably solve a problem for others. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you can solve problems not only for yourself and for a lot of other people, uh, that's a super, super fun way to make a living and super lucrative. And so one of the first problems that I encountered that I really wanted to tackle uh, was around transportation. Mm -hmm. When I was at Babson, I couldn't afford to have a car on campus. And one night I really wanted pizza from my favorite pizza shop, and they wouldn't deliver to campus. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if there was an app that let me rent a car from another student? And I shared the idea with my twin brother. He was also on campus with me, and he said, let's build it. So we built the ugliest app you've ever seen, but it was <laughs> just good enough that it allowed us to rent cars from other students on campus. What year was this, by the way? This was around 2017, 2018. Okay. Yeah. And the time, it was really like the Wild West. We didn't even know about collecting taxes on the transactions. Oh. So you could literally rent a car for, uh, to take you from Wellesley, Massachusetts to Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was only like a 13 or 14 mile drive. Uh, you could literally rent a car for five, six, seven, eight, ten dollars $10 an hour. Oh. And so that app, which started in our dorm room, what we would work on between classes on the weekend for fun, it ended up becoming one of the top apps on the App Store. It became the second highest ranked car sharing app in the country. And over the course of a couple of months, we ended up having cars physically available to rent on more than 500 college campuses in all 50 states. Wow. And that was really uh, our first, my first experience in, in the world of product and, and building and, and apps and, and all that stuff. And you had no experience in any of that before? This. No, I mean, my brother and I, we've always been pretty curious people. My brother's much more technical than me. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was really our experience. That was really our first time ex doing that. Before that, my only job ever was my freshman year for the holiday season. 
Uh, I worked at Nordstrom as a as in, in this men's sportswear department, and before that, I worked on the family farm. Wow, wow! And, and did did you do coding for fun or anything? I mean, do you have any any experience <clears throat> in that? That's crazy. So my experience coding is was super limited. I would go on to Code Academy or I would go on to TeamTreehouse.com. My brother jumped into it much more than I did. Mm -hmm. So my brother is extremely technical. Uh, but to your point, my brother was very much self-taught. One of the things that's really great about living in Boston or in the Boston area is that you could take the train or you can take the bus right into Cambridge, uh, which is where Harvard and MIT are, and you can go to the bookstores. And the bookstores have these big books on learning Python, on HTML, on C++. Uh, you think about the Boston ecosystem, it's very technical. And so you would have React Native meetups. Wow. And so we would go ahead and we would join all of those things. We would go on Saturday mornings to the coop right next to Harvard and we would just spend time reading books on how do you program, on startups, on building. And it was just this extreme innate sense of curiosity uh, that we just we fell in love with. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the first time I ever really got intrigued uh, by, by programming, uh, it was a Friday night and somebody showed us how uh, you can change the source code on, uh, on the homepage for Yahoo. And I would go ahead and mess around with the, source, uh, with the source code and I would log into my bank account, my Bank of America account, and I would go ahead and change the source code on the page, huh. and suddenly it, met, it went from looking like I had $6 in my bank account to looking like I had $6 million in my bank account, <laughs> and I would send a photo to my mom, and I would laugh, and she'd call me. She, one time my aunt called me crying. She's like, I can't believe you made so much money, and I, I had to tell her I was just kidding. I just changed some, <laughs> some, wow. some, some of the code on the screen. But again, it, just, it was really, really this innate sense of curiosity and, and becoming obsessed with it, and, and that's how we learned. That's, that's how we did it. So well, let's, let's stop here for a sec. Like, okay, you had the number two uh, car sharing app on the App Store. Um, you're in 500 college campuses? Okay, how much money are you guys you know, kind of making? Oh, we weren't making anything. And that was the first time that we ever learned just because you build a good product doesn't mean you build a good business. Mm -hmm. So that business, long story short, when the pandemic hit and college campuses shut down, uh, that business died. And that was, again, a huge learning lesson. Uh, that was a learning point for us. Uh, I never forget the first week or the first day that we ever launched it publicly to give you a sense. Uh, we did about $89,000 worth of bookings wow. and we pretty much generated no revenue. Uh, and the reason for that is, if you think about 2018, 2019, that was a period of time where you had companies like Uber and Lyft and Turo and Getaround. They were raising hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. And so if you were going to jump into the shared mobility space, be ready to subsidize the hell out of things. And so uh, we were going ahead and we were having these transactions, but in order to try to go ahead and keep uh, the prices artificially low, we would go ahead and we wouldn't even take the fees ourselves. We would go ahead and just pass, we'd, we'd tell the car owners, hey, you could own 100, you could keep 100% of the fees. Wow. And, and so it was not a great business. It, it so ended up dying. So was that just an effort to get more people on the platform? And yeah, because the supply side, in many marketplaces, the supply side is actually not the challenge. It's access to affordable, convenient transportation is something that, uh, many people face more than 50% of college students do not have a car on campus. And mm -hmm. so it's really easy to go ahead and get the supply side of things. Yeah. You can get that for a super, super, super low customer acquisition cost. What becomes difficult is getting uh, the supply side of things. Uh, so the demand side is really affordable. The supply side ends up being a bit trickier. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is our business, really the transactions were dependent on college students fulfilling uh, rentals. So if I wanted to rent one, if I wanted to rent a car on a college campus, if I wanted to rent John's car on a college campus, when I press book to rent John's car, I had to be dependent that John was going to approve the rental mm -hmm. and then that he was going to bring me the car. Yeah. That fulfillment 
we, we call it fulfillment. That fulfillment problem was huge for us. Yeah. Like it was the biggest problem that we faced. And, and why is that? Because your supply, you're depending on a college student that may be in classes, yeah. may be getting drunk, may be smoking. You don't know what the heck they're doing. And that's why you see that marketplaces, companies like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, Turo, get around, as they start to reach scale, one of the things they start to do is they start to professionalize the supply side. That's why on Turo, most of the vehicles on Turo are not owned by individuals. They're mm -hmm. actually owned by small business fleets. Yeah. Most of the apartments on Airbnb are not owned by individuals anymore, but now they're owned by these short-term rental companies. Yeah. So that is what happens as a marketplace scales. You need to go ahead and professionalize the supply. And we did not do a great job of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so COVID hits, no one's on campuses. I mean, how does it kind of go on? It just people stop using it and you guys just stop focusing on it? The app just kind of dies? Or? Well, there were two things. So leading up, in the months leading up to the pandemic, we did not know that a pandemic was brewing, but one of the things that had happened was we did go ahead and raise some capital for that business. Mm. One of the craziest things that happens is we end up getting a group of high net worth individuals very well-known names, established names. And they said they were going to invest in the company. And so one of them went so far as to even sign the contract to invest in the company. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they told us was they said, hey, we're just getting our, our entity set up, but go ahead and start using our name. Go ahead and start hiring. Go ahead and start building out the company. Yeah. And we went ahead and we started to do that. Ugh. And I'll never forget a few weeks before the pandemic hit, uh, they came to our office, two of them. They took us to the back of the, of the office and they said, congratulations, you've now entered the trough of sorrow. They knew that we were short on capital. They completely changed the terms of the deal. <laughs> and we agreed to basically sell them 50% of the company for nothing. Yeah. And they went ahead and they actually just never wired the money. So that never went through. Uh. And at that point, we were already low on capital. So when the pandemic hit, you're exactly correct. From one day to the next, there was no more business. There were no more rentals. There was not even, we were making a little bit of money, but none of that anymore. Mm -hmm. And then also this funding fell through. And that was pretty much the end of the business. Now, one of the things that we always realized was that a lot of people saw that as a car sharing business, we spent most of our time on the insurance side of things. Mm -hmm. And that was a problem that we knew that not only we were facing, but that was a problem that we pretty much came to learn that any business in the shared economy space was dealing with on a, on, on a daily basis. Uh, so insurance for many of the companies in the shared economy ends up being not your main business, but it ends up being mission critical to your business. Sure. And so you end up having to spend a lot of resources, time and energy there. And that's where my brother and I started thinking, hey, we've had to solve a lot of insurance related problems for ourselves. I can almost guarantee that there are other companies facing these same challenges and these same problems. What about this insurance infrastructure that we built? <clears throat> What if we can go ahead and commercialize that? What if we can start licensing that or start selling it to other businesses? Wow. And that's where one day I had the idea, Stripe for insurance. In the same way that Stripe eliminates the need for businesses to build payment infrastructure, mm -hmm. I said, what if we could eliminate the need for companies to build their own insurance infrastructure? Yeah. And if we could do that, we could build Stripe for insurance. And basically that's what we started to work on in the summer of 2020. And just like the movie War Dogs, <clears throat> One day we got a phone call. It turns out the US military was looking to launch <laughs> the same thing we were doing on college campuses. They wanted to do on military bases and they could not figure out the insurance side of things. And so naively, I said, yeah, I'd love to go ahead and advise on this project. Sure. I jumped on that first phone call. I gave everything away. I said, who to talk to from an insurance perspective. I said, how to frame the pitch <laughs> to the carriers. I said, how to manage the risk how to manage the claims. I gave them everything. And at the end of the phone call, they said, okay, so how much is this gonna cost us? I said, what? They said, yeah, we have nobody in the company that can do this. Wow. We'll, we'll pay you to do that. <laughs> and at that point, we owed the world money. I owed so many people money uh, and, and I said $250,000. And my brother thought that was really expensive. He wanted to tell them $10,000. Yeah. And the guy on the other line said, 
oh, that's not bad. If it were anything less, I'd be concerned. And that was how we got our first contract. Wow. And the next 20 contracts that we got was literally going to small businesses in the car rental space mm -hmm. and saying, hey, we can help you reduce your insurance expenses. How? We're going to make it really, really easy for you guys to get better insurance policies. We're going to make it really easy for you guys to better manage your claims. We're going to make it easy for you to make your business safer yeah. by implementing risk management practices. And by the way, we're going to make it really easy for you to manage all of your policies digitally. And by doing that, we're going to help reduce the cost of insurance for your business. I got about 20 companies to sign letters of intent mm -hmm. before we ended up building the full product. And that way, once we built the product by end of 2020, we had customers almost day one. Wow. And that was just, your, your first customers were car share? It was car rental companies. Car so rental small companies. independent car rental companies. Okay. And that was literally cold calls, cold emails. But one of the things my brother always says, he says, think about this. If you're trying to email, let's say I'm trying to email you, you're probably getting 50 other cold emails a day. Yep. Let's say I'm trying to cold call you. You're probably getting 10 cold calls a day. If you have an office, it's very rare that somebody actually comes into the office trying to sell you. Right. And so the competition there is almost nothing. Especially and now. <laughs> especially now. And especially during the pandemic, right. imagine they were just sitting in their office doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we would walk into the office, sometimes we would walk in with croquettes or snacks and say, hey, just give me five minutes or 10 minutes of your time. 50% of the time people would kick us out. 50% yeah. like of the time people would be like, okay, yeah, I'll take a conversation with you. I'll yeah. take a free, a, a free sandwich or something. And by the way, our AI product that we've spoken about, that's how we got the first couple of customers, uh, just like that. So <clears throat> that was, for, that, for Lula, that was summer of 2020, end of 2020, and 2021 is really where things start to take off. Yeah. Okay, so you have 20 customers just before you even build it. Yep. And for, found, for potential founders, maybe people that are listening to this and will go on to found something, um, you would recommend that strategy, get the customers first and then build it after? Or? Oh yeah, for sure. So for me, one of the things we often talk about at Lula is um, you can be one of four things. You can be a customer obsessed company, you can be a product obsessed company, you can be a competitor obsessed company, or in today's day and age, you can be a fundraising obsessed company. Mm -hmm. At Lula, we are a customer obsessed company. And one of the questions I often get when I say that is, you're not product obsessed, you don't obsess over the product. And that's not the point of the statement. The point of the statement is when you are coming up with a product, where do you start? Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, I want to build a product. So they build a product that they think is really cool. Once they have that product, and you see this a lot in crypto, once they have that product, they start to look, what's a problem that my product solves? Right. And that's backwards. What you should do is you start with the customer mm -hmm. and you say, what is a problem? Perhaps what's the most important problem that this car rental company faces today? Yeah. Insurance. Sure. Okay. So if I could solve insurance for this car rental company or for this home sharing business or this ride sharing business, if I can solve their most important problem, I'm going to be their most important vendor. Right. And so what we like to do is we like to really start with the customer. Start with the customer and work our way backwards there. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things to do from a product perspective is say, what is the most important problem this customer is facing today? What's the most important problem our ICP is facing today? Okay, let's go ahead and start there. Why? The level of importance of the problem that you're solving is directly proportional to the level of importance that you're going to have in the face of your customer. Right. So for us, we like to start off with, what problem are we solving? Let's be very, very clear there. <clears throat> now, that could be a problem that you identify yourself. That's a problem that you could identify through customer discovery, just talking to a lot of people. Mm. But we like to start off with the problem. Once we're really clear with the problem, we like to go ahead, before we've really built out anything, we like to go ahead and validate that people are facing these problems, the problem is big enough that people are willing to pay you for it. Yeah. And the way we validate that is typically through some form of a letter of intent or pre-sales or pre-orders. Mm -hmm. Why? The worst thing 
in my opinion, that somebody could do, your time is super valuable. The worst thing that you can do is try to go ahead and build a product and then try to sell it. What we like to do, we do this with all of our products, we like to go ahead, identify the problem, identify the solution, yeah. go ahead and see if we can sell that before we've really put a lot of resources into it. Like I mentioned, use LOIs, use pre-orders, whatever you want to call it. But that way, you know that if you're going to put resources, time and energy into building this thing out, you have customers from day one. Yeah. That is something that's worked for us time and time and time again. Our first business, like I mentioned, Lula, <clears throat> actually the car sharing app, we did that. Mm -hmm. I went to my friends, I went to classmates. We validated that thesis before we ever built anything. That way, once we built it from day one, we had customers. With Lula, we went ahead and we got 24 companies to sign letters of intent, and then we had wow. that contract with the military. 19 of them ended up converting to customers. But from day one, we ended up having customers there. And then our most recent product, the AI product, we did something similar. And to give you a sense of how fast we're growing, Lula went from zero to $50 million in annual recurring revenue in about 36 months. Our AI product is growing almost three times as fast. So this is yeah. something that works extremely, extremely well and that we're huge fans of. Yeah, so I wanna to get to the AI product in yeah. a second, but okay, so th those initial 20 customers, uh -huh. what was the one uniform thing, obviously in insurance, but it was just claims get lost or I mean like, you know, not, I mean, what was their main issue within insurance? So <clears throat> consumer products tend to be tricky because consumers buy products for a host of reasons. Mm -hmm. A consumer may buy a product because it makes them feel good. A consumer may buy a product because it gives signal to the market that they have money. Uh, maybe it saves them money. What's awesome about B2B that I really enjoy is it's super, super simplified. People typically are only buying a product for you, from you for one of three reasons. Number mm -hmm. one, you help them make money. Number two, you help them save money. Or number three, you do a combination of the two, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> so our pitch was really simple. We are going to help you save money and mm -hmm. we're gonna help you make money. Now you ask, what exactly does that mean? Well, the first thing is, is on the insurance side of things, one of the most important things when purchasing insurance and when you're looking at who you're purchasing insurance with what appointments do they have? So mm -hmm. for example, you and I could be insurance agents. You may have five relationships with insurance carriers. I may have 20 relationships with insurance carriers. Mm -hmm. Typically the person that has more relationships with carriers is allowed to get you more quotes and that allows you to help, that, that enables you to reduce your prices. So that's right. number one. We helped a lot of businesses get better prices on their insurance. Why? Because of the relationships and the appointments that we had. So that's number one. It was all through your app. <clears throat> It was our app. I mean, there was so many things that were manual, especially in the early days. Sure. But yeah, <laughs> through the app, let's say yeah. that. So a reduction in insurance prices, that's number one. Okay. Number two, a lot of people think when you're gonna reduce your insurance prices, it's a function of how loud you scream and shout at your agent or the carrier. It turns out that you can scream a lot at the agent or you can scream a lot at the carrier, but there's only so much that's going to do. Yeah. If you want to go ahead and reduce your rates or stabilize your rates, you need to do a few things. Number one, you need to manage your business better. Mm -hmm. Why? <clears throat> well, if your business is safer, you're probably gonna have less claims. If you have less claims, well, that's gonna reduce your insurance rates. So that becomes the next big thing. <clears throat> Not only how do you make your business safer, well, one of the things, I'll give you a, a, a few cool things. A lot of car rental companies have random people come off the street that want to rent cars. Yeah. Well how the heck do you know who's gonna rent a car from you? You don't. Well, we ha like I remember I went to some of our customers and I said, how do you know if Joe is a high risk customer or a low risk customer? He's like, I don't, it's kind of a vibe check. I remember somebody told <laughs> <That's> me, <it? laughs> wow. I, I had somebody one time tell me they smell the customers. If the customer smells like weed or alcohol, they just don't rent a car to them. <laughs> so what did we do? We said, oh, there's much easier ways to do that. So. I can take your first name, your last name, your phone number, your email address. I could see how long has your email address been around. Mm -hmm. If your email address has been around for three hours, that's a very different risk profile than somebody's email address that's been around seven years. Right. I can look at your phone number. Is that a prepaid phone number? Is that phone number with Metro PCS or Verizon? 
Those are all very different risk profiles. And so when you extract all of that data, it allows me to create a risk profile on you. Yeah. And so now I can give, and by the way, that's what Uber does, that's what Airbnb does. So now I could give the same tools that Airbnb and Uber have, yeah. I could give those same resources and tools to small to medium sized businesses, right? And by the way, that makes your business significantly, significantly safer. Yeah. On the claim side of things, today a lot of small business owners have to manage the claim themselves. So if their car gets in a wreck, they're having to negotiate with the insurance companies, they're having to call the police to get a police report. That takes time from running your business. And if you manage a claim poorly, it's gonna end up being a more expensive claim, which by the way, is gonna increase your rates. Right. And so what we would do is we'd said, we're gonna manage your insurance infrastructure. We're gonna make it really, really easy for you to purchase insurance mm -hmm. and get insurance at a competitive rate, but we're gonna make your business safer. We're gonna give you tools like Lula Safe. Uh, improve your risk management. We're gonna go ahead and integrate directly with third-party administrators so that as soon as you need to submit a claim, you submit a claim and that's getting triaged to a professional claims adjuster, mm -hmm. right? And so, so- They're not doing any of that. They're not doing any of anymore. that. Wow. They're not doing any of that. Yeah. And, and so the pitch was really simple. We're gonna help you uh, save money. Mm -hmm. We did go ahead and also start allowing a lot of these car rental companies to legitimately start to monetize insurance. A lot of times you go to a small car rental company and they're selling insurance, but it's not kosher at all. Yeah. All they need is one bad claim and suddenly they're, they're getting investigated by the Department of Insurance for, oh. and they don't mean to do that. There's nothing malicious here. Mm -hmm. They just don't know any better. And so we allowed them to go ahead and start monetizing insurance in a way that was kosher. So we would do all of these different things. It was all one bundled price. And mm -hmm. we started to do that not only for car rental companies, we started to do it for business fleets. We started to do it for trucking companies. Oh, wow. And over the course of three years, we went from working with a few dozen companies. Last year, we surpassed more than 5,000 companies around the United States wow. and close to 8 million people that interact with the platform on an annual basis. And how are you guys getting customers at this point? It's not you guys going door to door with croissants. No, so what we, and again, we use the same strategies today. So the first thing that we focused on was really providing a strong customer experience. Mm -hmm. So referrals, referrals are a great way for us to get customers. We yeah. got to our first close to $30 million in revenue without a VP of marketing and without anybody internally marketing at Lula. Yeah. We got to our first $20 million in revenue with a sales team of less than 10 people. And what we leveraged was, we leveraged referrals from existing customers, but we also leveraged referrals from channel partners. We love working with channel partners. A channel partner, for example, could be, let's say that you are a software provider for car rental companies. Uh, well, yeah. it's, very, it's, very, very, it's very likely that car rental companies use the same software provider. Mm -hmm. So go find those software providers. In many instances, these software providers oftentimes are small to medium sized businesses. They may be doing five, six, $10 million a year in revenue. And so what we would do is we would go to those software providers and we'd say, hey, you guys have 500 car rental companies that use you, a thousand car rental companies that use you. We want you to refer your customers to us. And this is a big mistake a lot of people make. A lot of people make the mistake that they're gonna give the referral fees and it's gonna be a BS fee. I'll give you 2%, 3%. Right. No, make that referral fee a legitimate revenue channel for yeah. the channel partner. We had instances where people were making more money referring their customers <laughs> to us than they were making from their actual customers for their core product. Wow. So <clears throat> those were the two primary ways that we initially got customers and we scaled it up. Mm -hmm. Eventually, as we grew, we, we went ahead and we professionalized things. We grew out a formal sales team. We grew out a proper marketing team. And that added fuel to the fire. We, yeah. we went from adding a few million dollars in ARR on a quarterly basis to adding more than $10 million in a quarter uh, once we went ahead and professionalized those systems. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then uh, I know we, we briefly touched on the AI aspect. Gail, mm -hmm. why don't you go into that? Yeah, so number one, I'm a huge, huge, huge believer in AI. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about that for days. I'll give you a little bit of my thesis. So the first thing is, Growing up, I was always super jealous of people that <clears throat> were around for the internet, mm -hmm. for the petrochemical revolution, that were around for the industrial re revolution. I always wanted to be part of a technological revolution. 
One of the things that surprised me and excited me about AI is a lot of people look at AI and they're like, oh, that's just AI. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Artificial intelligence is like electricity. Yeah. It is a general purpose technology. It is a technology that can benefit the retail industry, the hospitality industry, the entertainment industry, the insurance industry. And so the same way technology like electricity could go ahead and benefit all of these different industries, I think that's exactly what you're seeing with artificial intelligence. Mm. Now, what are some of the things that really go ahead and excite me about artificial intelligence? I'll give you a few things. One of, one of my favorite problems to go ahead and ask, <clears throat> there's, I, I really like to ask these two problems from a product, uh, these two questions from a product perspective. The first one is, a lot of people say, what is going to change over the next 10 years? Let's get ahead of that. Mm. Uh, I like to take a different approach. I like to say, what is not going to change over the next 10 years? Well, when you go ahead and you ask that question, it allows you to anchor to stability. Mm -hmm. And so I know in 10 years, you are not gonna come to me and say, Michael, I want to pay more for this water bottle. Right. I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. I know that in 10 years, you're not going to go into Amazon and you're gonna say, man, they have too many, too many options here. I want less selection here, right? right? <clears throat> Artificial intelligence, one of the benefits that I think it's gonna have is that Today, one of the challenges, one of the most, probably the most important problem that we're facing as, as a society today, the cost of living. Yeah. It costs $100,000 to go to a private university today. Mm -hmm. The average American in the United States, uh, we spend, imagine this, the United States, we spend $14,000 a year per capita on healthcare, mm -hmm. right? In Japan, they're spending about $7,000 and the life expectancy is vastly different, right? <clears throat> so I think one of the most important questions that we also like to ask ourselves at Lula is what is the most important problem that our customers are facing today? Mm -hmm. One of the most important problems that society in general are facing today is that everything is so expensive. And so what I think is super amazing about artificial intelligence is that it has the ability to take a doctor's visit that today is $500, that doctor's visit could suddenly become 50 cents. Yeah. That tutor that is charging you 20, 30, 40 dollars an hour to go ahead and tutor your kid suddenly can be 50 cents an hour. Yeah. <clears throat> that that uh, that analysis by a doctor that they're going to charge you $500 for, all of a sudden AI can look at your CAT scan, can look at your MRI, can look at your X-ray and instead of charging you $500, that could be 50 cents. Those, those customer support reps or those office assistants that you have in your office that are quitting every couple of weeks, that are charging, that are costing you an arm and a leg, that are stressing you out, suddenly a customer support rep or a sales development uh, representative that's costing you $20 an hour, now with artificial intelligence is costing you a dollar an hour, $2 mm -hmm. an hour. And so artificial intelligence, from my perspective, has the ability uh, to reduce the cost of living significantly, but it also has the ability to go ahead and make a business owner, uh, a product manager, an engineer, a salesperson, it has the ability to increase their productivity by 100. Yeah. That's why I believe that in the next 10 years, we are going to see billion dollar companies that have five people in it, two huh. people in it. I don't think we're very far away from that. And so I think artificial intelligence has this ability to go, it's a, it's a force multiplier. You suddenly can do you, as an individual can certainly do the work of 50 people, 100 yeah. people. And I think if you go ahead and you put that in the hands of society, yes, there's the opportunity for a lot of bad, but there's also the opportunity for a lot of good. Yeah. I do think it's gonna go ahead and give people the ability to rise themselves out of poverty. Why? Suddenly, if you look at some of these recent models, some of these recent models have the equivalence IQ of 140, 150. Mm -hmm. So now imagine anybody with electricity or access to the internet has access to essentially Albert Einstein to yeah. be their own personal tutor. Right. That a is genius amazing. Assistant, exactly. Basically. A genius assistant, a genius tutor, a genius friend, mm -hmm. a genius colleague. I like to learn about new topics by going on to chat GPT, going on to Gemini and just having a conversation with it Yeah. and asking it questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so how exactly are you, did you, all right, so you had the insurance 
Lula app, uh, that was killing it. And then at what point do you, I don't want to say pivot, but what, what point do you tack on the AI service? Well, we were running and we've been building the businesses in, in general. So our AI product is called Gale. It stands for Generative AI by Lula. Mm. So we pretty much just built Gale as a separate business division. We, we gave it its own bank account. We put money into that bank account. We siloed the team, siloed, isolated the team to an extent and just said, this is what we're building. The problem that we were attacking is that, <clears throat> number one, as a business owner today, the cost of labor is increasing, mm -hmm. right? So it's becoming more and more difficult to run a profitable business. That's number one. Number two, it's becoming more and more difficult to go ahead and actually <clears throat> satisfy your customer. Why? Small businesses are now having to compete with Amazon that can provide amazing customer experience, right. can minimize the amount of time your customers are waiting on the phone. So <clears throat> not only are costs increasing, but it's becoming more and more difficult to satisfy your customer. And if you have increase of cost, you have in difficulty in how you can satisfy your customer, well, that's going to reduce the amount of money that you're making. Mm. And so when we looked at artificial intelligence, we said, hey, artificial intelligence helps businesses reduce their cost. Artificial intelligence helps businesses improve the customer experience. And artificial intelligence overall just allows businesses uh, to make more money. And we saw that particularly on the insurance side of things. Mm. So I'll give you a few examples. Today, we know that insurance agents and insurance carriers spend about 25% of their revenue just on support and sales functions. Wow. Uh, off the top of, so yeah. the insurance industry last year surpassed $7 trillion as an industry. It's the largest industry in the world from a revenue perspective. Mm -hmm. And about 25% of that is going just towards support and sales cost. If you look at it even more broadly, about 36%, almost 40% of that $7 trillion is being spent on human labor. Well, one of the problems is that we're entering our third year in a row where the insurance industry as a whole is going to lose money. This mm. is excluding life and health insurance. Yeah. So the insurance industry for a third year in a row is going to lose money. Well, what if you can go ahead and say, hey, instead of spending 36% of your revenue on on labor, what if we could reduce that to 25% or 20% or mm -hmm. 15%? Well, suddenly insurance carriers are going to start making money again. And what's the benefit there? Sure, they make money, but the benefit there to society is that your insurance rates can now be stabilized or actually reduced. Yeah, They'll and be so competing and exactly. Prices, so you make right? insurance a win win. Mm -hmm. And that is the benefit that we saw with Gail. We said, hey, <clears throat> If we want to go ahead and increase profitability uh, for the insurance companies so that we can help reduce prices for consumers or at least stabilize prices for consumers, AI is a great tool to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's where we started to work on Gale. Now, what Gale is, now what Gale is, is Gale is an artificial intelligence specifically for the insurance industry. We are not building AI for other industries. We're specifically focused on the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. And Gale is capable of servicing customers, selling to prospective customers in a human-like manner. So you cannot tell when you're speaking to Gale that you're speaking to a robot. And it's a voice. It's a voice, but not only voice, it can interact with the customer through voice. And we're also later this quarter releasing text message communications, email mm. communications, and even WhatsApp communications. Gale today is able to speak fluently in English, fluently in Spanish, and even in Japanese. The amazing thing about it is you can go ahead and have Gail talk like a Southern woman. You can have Gail talk like wow. a guy from Boston. And pretty soon you're going to be able to go ahead and replicate your own voice so that Gail talks just like you. But <clears throat> that, that is what we're doing with Gail. And the reason, I'll give you a, a few reasons it benefits insurance agents, for example. A lot of insurance agents are small business owners. They work from 9 to 5. Mm -hmm. After 5 p.m., they pretty much clock out. Well, one of the problems is that consumers tend to purchase insurance on nights and weekends when insurance agents are not working. Yeah. And so what happens a lot of times is you're shopping for insurance at 8 p.m., 9 p.m. at night, you fill out the form on the website, or you call the insurance agent and they just don't answer. Yeah. What is Gail able to do? Gail now 
is an artificial intelligence that works 24-7, 365, works nights, wow. weekends, holidays. <laughs> and now if you call the insurance agent's office at 8 p.m., 9 p.m. at night, Gail can answer that phone call. Gail sounds just like a human. It can answer questions about the agency. It can answer questions about what types of policies the agency sells, about who the agency works with. It can tell you the difference between what is a liability policy, what is a comprehensive and collision policy. It can even go ahead and say, oh, you're interested in purchasing an auto policy for your car? This is the information that I need from you. And that way, when you walk into the office the next morning at 9 a.m., you don't have to chase that customer anymore. Yeah. You have everything you need to go ahead and get that customer a quote and get them over the finish line. Yeah. And so, by the way, that phone call, you didn't need to pay somebody $15, $20 an hour to man the phone call overnight. Yeah. That phone call probably cost you a few pennies. Wow. And, and what's, obviously we, we'd be here for a while figure out exactly how you did it, but what's, what's the you know, 50,000 foot overview of how you achieve that? Data sets, all the insurance data sets you're just putting into these machine learning models? Or? Well, that's one of them. So one of the things that our thesis is that the same way that you saw ver uh, software get verticalized the last 20 years, you saw software was built specifically for the insurance industry, specifically for the retail industry, specifically for the hospitality industry. Mm. What you're going to see is you're going to see AI <clears throat> is going to get verticalized industry by industry. So you're gonna see AI that's specifically verticalized for the insurance industry, for the hospitality industry, for the retail industry, for the entertainment industry. And our perspective is you're gonna see AI get verticalized we decided instead of building AI for all of these different use cases, we're going to build AI specifically for the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. Now, to answer your question, you're exactly correct. When you look at these foundational models, all of these foundational models, for the most part, have largely been trained off similar data sets. Let's go ahead and scrape the internet. Let's go ahead and scrape public domains, books that are publicly, uh, that are publicly available. One of the things that we did as we went ahead and we and as we go ahead and vertically uh, verticalize uh, AI is we trained it specifically on insurance data sets that are not available to the public. Mm -hmm. Insurance textbooks. Such as, okay. I'll, I'll textbooks. give you I'll give you a few examples. So, <clears throat> insurance textbooks. Mm -hmm. Insurance textbooks that are not found online. Insurance textbooks that are uh, only made available to insurance carriers, yeah. insurance agencies, like their insurance entities. handbooks, basically. You're exactly okay. correct. Wow. You could go ahead, there are data sources that are only accessible to insurance entities, mm -hmm. right? We have insurance entities. We have access to that data that nobody else has access wow. to before. Wow. <clears throat> There's a lot of law and legislation that is not available online. So what did we do? We hired a team overseas to go state by state and try to go ahead and find pieces of legislation that are wow. not available on public domains, we go ahead and we scrape that. But not only that, I mean, remember, we have a customer, we have a, we have a, a platform that more than 5,000 businesses use on a monthly basis, has interacted with more than 8 million people in the United States over the last 12 months. All of those, all of those are data points that we use and we leverage, mm -hmm. and so, <clears throat> That is how, how we went ahead and did some of the training. Now, there's a lot of different conversation around, do you go ahead, do you build your own model? Do you go ahead and fine tune your own model? Where do you go ahead and sit on the, on the infrastructure stack? Our perspective is the infrastructure stack uh, is broken up into four layers. You mm -hmm. have the hardware layer, that's NVIDIA and whatnot. There's no way we're gonna compete with that. Right. Then on top of that, you have dev tools and you have infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Dev tools are companies like Eleven Labs. They are phenomenal. And then you have infrastructure. That is something like OpenAI, mm -hmm. right? In order for the infrastructure layer, for dev tools, and for the hardware layer to all work, you need a fourth layer. And that fourth layer is the application layer. Mm -hmm. That is where we sit. We're very, very much at the application layer. Okay. And that is where there's going to be a lot of money. You think about, for example, Uber's an application. Snapchat's an application. 
Yes, the cloud companies have done fantastic over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. but the cloud companies would not exist if you did not have that application layer that was doing extremely, extremely well. Right. And so that is where we play. We very much play on the application layer and there's a lot of alpha to be made there. Yeah, yeah. And, and one thing I, I really wanted to ask you, obviously this is a Tech Careers podcast. Uh, why don't you give people some guidance Obviously, you're building an AI company. Um, how could people get involved? What should they focus on? Um, I mean, technology perspective, job title perspective. I mean, let's hear it from you. One of the points that I made earlier is, and I think this goes just generally speaking, your level of compensation is directly proportional uh, to the magnitude of the problems that you're solving. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> and I don't mean this offensively, but why does somebody at McDonald's working the cashier get $10 an hour versus an L7 engineer at Meta get paid a million dollars a year? Right. Well, it's very likely that that L7 engineer is probably working on a problem that maybe 500 people, 1,000 people, around the world cannot, there's only 500 people around the world that can probably do that. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at, when, when somebody comes to me and says, hey, how do I break into a company like Lula? What could I do? Or how do I break into tech? Well, I've gotten to the point that when I'm looking to hire somebody or I'm looking to interview, some, when I'm interviewing somebody, I just wanna know what problems can you solve for me? Mm -hmm. Right? <clears throat> a lot of people reach out to me and they say, hey, Michael, uh, how do I get involved in Lula? How, you need to become really, 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 really good at, at solving problems. To me, that is the ultimate. What is product and what is engineering? If you're on the product and engineering side of things, you need to get good at identifying what's the problem that we're trying to solve and mm -hmm. then go ahead and solve that problem. If you're on the operation side, what are you saying? You're saying, hey, what are the problems that the company is facing today that, that we need to solve in order to hit the next level? Right. If you are on the sales side of things, what are you doing? You're identifying problems for your customer, you have a solution, and your job is to bring that customer from where they are and drive them towards the solution. Mm -hmm. And so for me, if you want to go ahead and get involved in technology or you want to go ahead and get good high paying jobs, become really, really, really good at solving problems. Now, <clears throat> if you're an outsider, this is where what I like to do is I like to go ahead and become obsessive on a particular topic. So I'll give you an example. I don't have a traditional AI background. I don't have a traditional ML background. So how do I go ahead and I get caught up well, I throw myself into it. Mm -hmm. I go ahead and I follow all the best thought leaders in the space on Twitter. I go ahead and I find who are the top minds in AI? Jeffrey Hinton, Elliot Sitzkever. Mm -hmm. Okay, go listen to all of their interviews. Right. Go listen and find what they're tweeting about. Okay, I recently found Elliot Sitzkever on Twitter. Somebody, went, somebody asked him, what are the 30 best things to read if I wanna become an AI expert? Well, he went ahead and he listed the 30 things you, want, you need to, to read if you want to become an expert on AI. Yeah. Nobody's going to go ahead and read that. I'd say 99.5% of people are never going to read that. Well, what did I do? I went ahead and I bookmarked that tab. Huh. And guess what I do? I go ahead and I read, I try to read at least one of those documents every single day. Yeah. Go read it. Attention is all you need. Go ahead and read that entire document. But you really want to go ahead and almost lock yourself in a room for 30 days, 60 days, just read and consume all the material that you can and when you get out, you're gonna be way ahead of the average person. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so anybody that's trying to go ahead and break into tech, anybody that's trying to go ahead and break into AI, I'd say go ahead and get obsessive over it. Go mm -hmm. ahead and get manic about it. And by the way, it doesn't need to be like that about AI. It doesn't need to be like that about tech. If you are super interested in construction, for example, go ahead and find a local construction company in your area message the business owner, manage, message one of the general contractors there and say, hey, what are the five problems that you're facing today? Mm -hmm. I wanna solve them for you. Yeah, 
Yeah, and so right now, uh, you will be hiring in machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, anything else uh, specific to AI, uh, job title wise, that people should look out for? Well, I mean, the thing is, is the AI space has been around for the last, call it, a couple of decades. But what we're seeing today is, is we see the emergence of general, uh, generative uh, artificial intelligence. We see the emergence of neural networks. We see the emergence of diffusion models and transformers. These are things that, for the most part, have not existed for more than a couple of years. Right. And so the problem that you're finding is that there are not many experts in this field. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? Who the hell do you hire? And, and one of the most amazing things I've recently learned is I could not, for the life of me, understand why so many people in the artificial intelligence space are fascinated with World War II. I could not understand it. Hmm. Why is that? Well, think about the Manhattan Project. Yeah. The Manhattan Project, the average person working in the Manhattan Project was 26 years old. Wow. It wasn't until 1937 that the Germans supposedly found out that we could go nuclear, that there were, we could actually build a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. So the Manhattan Project started, what, late 30s, early 40s? There were no experts on nuclear bombs. There were no, there, there were none. And so you suddenly had people that were trying to go ahead and learn a new topic really, 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 really quick. And the government was forced to take a chance on, on these 24, 25, 26 year olds yeah. to learn really, really, really fast. And I think that is what you're seeing in the AI space. Some of these topics are so new, they're probably, are not more than 100 experts worldwide. Right. Well, the problem is, is that there's thousands of AI companies. And so, <clears throat> yeah, we're certainly hiring for AI positions. We're certainly hiring for ML positions. We're certainly hiring. But what we've come to realize is that there is no way, there's almost no way that we're going to compete with OpenAI or Claude or, right. or it's Anthropic, but or Google, that just becomes really difficult to compete against. So what do you have to do? You need to go ahead and find people that could learn really, really fast. You need mm -hmm. to find people that are extremely curious. They have a strong sense of learning agility. They can go ahead and learn on the fly. They're very malleable. They're willing to go ahead and lock themselves up in a room for 30, 60 days and become an expert in the field. They're willing to go ahead and say, okay, I'm gonna read every single paper that Elias Discover learned or yeah. uh, suggested. I'm gonna go ahead and learn that. I'm gonna go ahead and read that. So from your perspective, I mean, the, the challenge for you is obviously it's so new. You, it's not a, these are not skill sets that you've done it for five years and you can tell, oh, tell me about when you were here or here. For the most part, that's not the case, but for you, do, you're doing interviews, you're asking them, have they read some of this? okay, who do you follow in AI? Like you're asking them about their kind of personal habits too, correct? Their well, interests, I guess. What I'm trying to figure out on a, at the interview level is, okay, you have no idea, you, you don't know much about AI. You don't know much about ML. Mm -hmm. Let's say you don't know much about insurance. Walk me through, what's your process to learn a lot about a topic? What, what's right. that process look like? Yeah. And I'll give you a few examples. When somebody, for example, I'll give you a real, a real example. <clears throat> we, hired a, we hired a product manager for one of our risk products. Guy had an amazing background. Came f he did risk management and fraud detection work at PayPal and then mm -hmm. at Cash App. Interviewed really well. Yeah. Interviewed so well that I did not ask my typical line of questioning of how do you learn about a new topic? Because mm -hmm. I assumed he already knew a lot about fraud detection. Yeah. He comes into the company, we hire him, two weeks pass. I'm like, I haven't heard of this guy in any customer interview, in any customer conversations. So I sat down with him and I said, hey, how are you learning about the topic? How are you learning about insurance? How are you learning about the customer? That was awful. He, he did not Nothing. end up lasting very long. Wow. But one of my questions is, if you're not familiar with a topic, I want to understand how are you going to become familiar with the topic? Yeah. Well, go talk to customers. I love that answer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when we were hiring our CFO, he had no experience with insurance. So what did he do? He actually went ahead and reached out to some of his buddies that work in the insurance industry. Yeah. 
and said, hey, I will treat you to dinner because I want to learn about insurance. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking for when we're hiring an engineer or a product manager that's never worked in the space. How are you going to learn about AI? Well, I'm going to go ahead and read every single piece of, of, of literature that I've heard Elias Skaver mention. Yeah. That's phenomenal. <clears throat> I'm going to go watch every single video on YouTube that IBM has put out or that Google has put out on artificial intelligence, on machine learning. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know what I'm going to do? I live in San Francisco. There's AI meetups all the time. Yeah. So once or twice a week, I'm going to go to these AI meetups and I'm going to learn from other people in the industry. Those are the types of things that you want to hear. Yeah. If you're not willing to go ahead and do that work, why the hell would we take a chance on you? Right. And it's funny, we had um, a cybersecurity manager. Mm -hmm. And just for anyone you know, looking to get hired, he had a very similar line of questioning. Oh, you, you want to get a cybersecurity job? Do you listen to any podcasts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, which ones? If yeah. they didn't have a good answer... Or, you know, or if they said, oh, do you listen to this one? Yeah. Well, which interview do you like? Mm -hmm. If they, you know, they kind of stammering, then it was like, okay, you, you don't follow this stuff. Yeah. So it's interesting. You're, you have, you know, basically the, the same advice for people. Well, for me, I often get the question, what is one of the things you look at that you've determined, determined success? I think I've been very fortunate that I've been in close proximity to a lot of successful people. The thing that surprises me, and it never fails to surprise me, is the level of curiosity. It's almost as though the more successful a person is, the more curious they are. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's blown me away. And so a lot of times when we're dealing with candidates, I want to see their level of curiosity. What do you do when you're not working? Mm -hmm. Oh, I listen to these podcasts. I read these books. Okay, that's great. If you're a product manager or you're an engineer, and I'm sorry, if you're not listening the podcast outside of work, if you're not reading blogs, if yeah. you're not, that's a red flag for me. We don't want somebody that it's gonna, it's a nine to five for them and then they're gonna clock out. We yeah. want somebody that says, hey, I'm really curious about this stuff. I really want to learn about this stuff. So much so that when I'm not working at Lula or when I'm not working on Gale, I still want to be leveling up. Yeah. The other thing that I love to ask is, where do you see yourself in five years? And quite frankly, I'm not looking for I want to be at Lula in the next five years. That's not what I'm looking for. Hmm. What I'm looking right. for is that your goals align with what we're hiring you for. So for, ex or, 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 so for example, we've had this situation before where somebody is, <clears throat> I'm, an I'm interviewing for an engineering position. Okay, what do you want to do in five years? Well, I really have a dream to, uh, to be a musician. Why would we hire you? Right. You're going to work a couple of hours a day and then you're going to go play your guitar. Or... Yeah. Leave as soon as you get your big break. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Why? That's, there's nothing wrong with that. But why would I go ahead and invest time, energy? No, what, what we want is what are your goals? Oh, well, I'm an entry level engineer today, but I'd love to be a kick ass IC in the next couple of years. Yeah. I'm an entry level engineer today, but I'm dying to go ahead and one day build a product that's used by millions of people. That's fascinating. Yeah. I don't even mind if somebody says one day I want to be a founder. I'll tell you this, Brian Armstrong, worked, founder of Coinbase, worked at Airbnb for, 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 for some time. Mm. If Brian Armstrong comes to Lula, and I have the opportunity to have Brian Armstrong work on my team, knowing that he, in three years he's going to go start Coinbase, I'll take that bet. I'll take that any day of the week. Sure. Brian Armstrong come and work at my company for a couple of years. Yeah. That's phenomenal. So I don't have a problem with somebody saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and start my thing in a couple of years. But what you do want to see is you do want to see some sort of alignment from where are they today and where do they want to be? Yeah. If you're a salesperson, okay, I want you to say, I'm going to be making a million dollars in commissions in five years, or I want to be a VP of sales in the next five years. That's great. That's great. I don't want you to say, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an enterprise software person, uh, salesperson today, but I'm hoping to have my own insurance agency in the next three years. Right. It's like we're just a side gig. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's interesting because for startups and, and company, you know, it's kind of a diff, like those questions could be diff. Some, if you were a Fortune 500 manager, 
mm-hmm. could be a totally different answer you're looking for. You, they may want someone that just wants to go, oh, I just want to you know, do my thing nine to five and leave. That might be all they need. For startups, you need passionate people. Right? Yeah, well, think about this. Let's say you're a startup with 100 people. Yeah. That means every single person represents 1% of your company. Right. Let's say you're a startup with 10 people. That means each person makes up 10% of your company. Those are sizable chunks. At a right. Fortune 500 level, there's 10,000 people. Yeah. You're not even 0.1% of the company. And so at that point, we often say this. <clears throat> I think a lot of times in the Valley, it's almost overblown. I need these 10 extras. Absolutely, you need the 10 extras. Companies don't get built to be special companies without 10 extras. But sometimes you don't need the world's best person to mop the floor. You just need somebody to mop the floor. Right. That is not a problem that you run into so much in the early days of startup. Uh, in the early days of the startup, you should be much, much more intentional about who you hire. Mm. You, <clears throat> but by the time you're 5,000 people, 10,000 people, sometimes you just need somebody to mop the floor. Right. And you don't need the world's best mopper. You just need somebody that's going to do it. And so it doesn't matter if that person's mopping floors for your company a couple of hours a day, and then afterwards they're working on their mixtape or they're working on their own project. There's nothing wrong with that. It's yeah. just stages and levels to the company. Yeah. Yeah, and, and how many employees do you guys have currently? So we hit 120. By the time this comes out, I'm sure the news will be made. We just went ahead and uh, we're going through an acquisition right now, and that is going to be about half the company. Wow. Um, but, but, but yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, anything else? Any last thoughts uh, on Gail on Lula? And I mean, obviously you gave some great tips for interviews and, and kind of industries to target, but anything else you want to add on? My biggest thing is whether you're a founder, whether you're somebody looking for jobs, whether you're trying to break in, the best piece of advice, one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got was you want to make yourself a big target for luck. You want to make yourself a big a target for opportunity. Yeah. Wow. And, and, that, and, and that to me is is send that cold email, uh, send that cold DM, uh, reach out to people. <clears throat> the, our first investor, our first VC ever was because I saw him tweeting, our first VC ever in Lula, uh, I reached out to him because I saw him tweeting on LinkedIn that they were making investments in the midst of a pandemic and I shot my shot. So you want to go ahead and make yourself a big target for luck and a big target for opportunity. And, and one of the ways you do that is with curiosity. Wow. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to top that advice. Uh, so we will leave it from here. I want everyone to look out for Lula and Gail. Uh, obviously going to be some big things coming from Michael. Uh, thanks again. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and, appreciate uh, we'll it. catch you guys next time.